Good afternoon uh, to all of you joining us uh, today in Timber Design Society's fourth webinar of Series 22. My name is Namir. I'm a member of the TDS Management Committee. This webinar is kindly sponsored by the following organizations. TDS uh, Committee expresses its uh, thanks and appreciation to these uh, sponsors for funding its activities. Xlam, Simpson Strong, MyTech, and Future Build LVL. <clears throat> Today, webinar is presented by Emma O'Neill uh, about uh, lessons and successes from a five-story hybrid timber building, Tiara o Puanga. Emma is a structural engineer at PTL Structures and Consultants in Christchurch, specializing in design of uh, timber structures. Emma is originally from Canada, where she obtained her bachelor's degree in uh, structural design, sorry, structural engineering, and her master of engineering in integrated wood design before moving to New Zealand. As Bernadette said, please post your brief and short questions in the Q&A button. Thank you very much once again, and look forward to see you on the 23rd of June. Please allow me to welcome Emma O'Neill. Emma, thank you very much. Thanks for the introduction, Namir. Um, as Namir mentioned, my name is Emma O'Neill and I'm a structural engineer at PTL Structural Consultants. Um, I moved to New Zealand from Canada about four years ago and I've been working for PTL ever since, um, designing a variety of timber structures in New Zealand and across the Pacific Islands. And today I'm gonna to be talking to you about lessons and successes from a five-story hybrid timber building, Te Ara O Puanga. So first to give you a little bit of background about PTL, uh, we are a structural engineering consultancy based in Christchurch and recently also Queenstown. Um, and we specialize in the design of timber structures. So here's a couple examples of some of the structures that we've designed in recent years. We also design steel and concrete, but timber is our expertise. Um, of all the major timber structures uh, that have been built in New Zealand in the last couple of years, PTL has been involved in a majority of those projects, either as the engineers or peer review or as specialist timber or um, structural fire consultants. And the project I'm gonna be talking to you about today is actually the first project that I worked on when I started working at PTL, which is Teara Opuanga, uh, formerly known as the Mary Potter Apartments. You may have heard that name. Um, but I'm just gonna quickly introduce the client of this project before I get into the structure. So the client of this project is the Mary Potter Hospice and they are a charitable organization providing free of charge hospice care to people in need in the Wellington region. And they decided that they wanted to build an apartment building to rent out to generate sustainable income for their hospice. So this is the structure. It's a five story light timber frame structure with four stories of light timber framing on top of steel and concrete. And it's built right beside the existing inpatient unit uh, in Newtown Wellington. And this was completed in 2021. Uh, being a hospice, the clients had some specific requirements. So the first one being minimal construction noise. Um, the hospice was to remain fully operational during the duration of the construction. So they wanted to make sure they were minimizing the disruption to the patients in the inpatient unit. So having construction methodology with limited construction noise was really important. There's also quite a limited space on site, which you'll see in the following slides. So not only did this um, factor into the design of the structure itself, but also the construction methodology and reduced time frame, which is kind of what all clients want. But um, in this case, again, they wanted to limit disruption to the patients in their inpatient unit. So with these requirements, the decision was then to go with a timber structure um, to best meet these uh, requirements. And originally they were wanting to do a CLT structure 
but because at the time, this was about five years ago, there was only one CLT supplier on, on shore in New Zealand and they were just a bit uncomfortable with the uncertainty around that. So they decided to go to a light timber frame system. You can see from this photo, um, the white building in behind the apartments is the hospice. So it's very, very tight. You can also see it's a sloping site and you can note the big tree right in front of the structure. And there's not a lot of space on the site. Um, so a small parking area and a small driveway, but not a whole lot of space for construction. Uh, this is the photo of the site before construction started. So you can see it's really quite a small, narrow site right beside the inpatient unit. Um, so of note in this photo, the sloping site, um, the inpatient unit on the left, the tree on the right in the back uh, was protected and had to remain um, safe and healthy through the duration of the construction, which posed a bit of a challenge, and the buildings in behind um, also remained. So as you can see, the tree lived, which is great. Everyone was quite happy. It's kind of an interesting view from a few of the apartments, but the client was quite happy that the tree could stay. This photo also shows just how close um, the apartments actually were to the existing building. So the apartment buildings are the photo on the are the building on the left and the inpatient unit is shown on the right. So it really was quite tricky, not only for construction, but also for um, the design of the facade elements and whatnot. And again, some interesting views out of some of these windows. Luckily for the apartments, these windows are just in the hallway, but I think some of the rooms from the uh, inpatient unit have kind of a boring view now. There was a couple uh, specific structural design challenges for this project. So by the time we as the structural engineers were brought on board, there had been already quite a lengthy um, resource consent procedure that had been had, that had been gone through. So um, by the time we were brought on board, the kind of main design and shape and geometry of the building was already locked in. We kind of just had to deal with what we were given. So the building, as you can see, this is a plan um, of the structure is L-shaped. It has re-entrant corners at a couple areas. There's openings between the two building sections for the lift shaft and the stairwell. Um, this is a section view. You can see there's a split level to take into account the sloping site, offset bracing walls, interruptions of vertical structural members, and different construction materials. So as we mentioned, this is a hybrid structure and it's kind of a true hybrid in that it's not only hybrid timber with mass timber floors and light timber framing walls, um, but also steel and concrete in the lower levels. So just to run you through the structural system. So it is a four stories of light timber framing on steel and concrete. And I've kind of split it up to show the north and south section. And this is where that um, step in the, in the building is. So in the north section, um, the structure is supported on concrete beams and um, concrete retaining walls and cast in situ walls. And on the south section, there's large steel post and beam structure with large cantilevered beams and some concrete block walls and concrete walls. On top of that, we had a concrete com floor floor system and light timber frame walls. Um, the framed walls were uh, prefabricated from Concision and Christchurch and then delivered to site as required. We also have some steel and, and timber beams and columns were required. Um, mostly we were able to use timber beams and columns, but there were a couple locations at the ground floor that where we did require steel just because we had such large loads. Um, you can also see the balconies are a clip-on balcony system. So that means that there's no posts for these balconies. Um, so we had steel backspans that spanned underneath the floors and then just a welded up steel balcony that came in and was just bolted on on site. Then above the first level, we had glue lamb floor panels. So these are wood span PLT floors. Um, we had the light timber framing walls continuing up the building. And again, uh, timber beams and columns were required. Um, we also had light timber frame walls for the stairwell and the lift shaft. So we didn't have concrete cores or anything like that. And this construction continued up the rest of the building. And then once we got to the roof, we have a light steel roof system with DHS purlins and steel um, bracing straps for the diaphragm loads. Some features of this building. 
Um, as I mentioned, there was a sloping site, so we had stepped ground um, with some quite significant earthworks required. Luckily, I think they hit some rock, so they ended up with fairly good ground to deal with, but there was still a lot of um, retaining required. We had shotcrete walls. There was underpinning required to the existing building uh, foundation and um, quite a lot of concrete and earthworks. Then we had the concrete podium. So you can see this is the, a photo of the north section of the building concrete podium. And the concrete lift shaft is shown there as well as um, the stair, or sorry, the lift shaft is shown in um, formwork and the stair stairwell is shown there. Um, and I, I mentioned these are light timber framing. This is just in the concrete podium level, they're concrete and then they become light timber framing as we go up the building. On the south side of the building, we have the cantilevered steel car park area. So you can see the very large steel beams that were required and some interesting reinforcing around the large penetrations in the car park. Um, on the left side of this photo, you can see that the beams cantilever out quite far. And on that line is where all our bracing walls came down. So we had some um, quite interesting detailing to make sure that we could take all those bracing loads on those cantilevers. And you can see the concrete block walls around um, the car park area as well. The light timber frame walls in this structure, as I mentioned, were all prefabricated coming from concision. Um, for all the bracing walls and external walls, these were pre-lined on one side, um, which included the structural ply for the bracing walls and any other jib requirements for fire or um, external facade. Uh, they also had the building wrap installed and windows were pre-installed as well. Some of the walls, which were non-structural, um, as you can see in this photo, came unlined and then they were lined on site. And these walls were just delivered to site um, as required, basically delivered right as they were being installed on site. Uh, one a specific element of this design uh, that's kind of a feature is the hold down system that we used. So in light timber frame construction, often small steel brackets are used for the hold downs and the bracing walls. But because we were in Wellington and we had very large seismic loads and this was a five story building, we did end up with some very significant hold down loads in our bracing walls, which weren't able to be handled by steel brackets. So we ended up going with the MyTech Z4 rod system, which are these steel tension rods in the bracing walls. Um, and I'll show you a video at the end of the presentation from my tech that kind of goes a bit more into detail about these, but um, this system, there's another one by Simpson Strong Tie that's kind of the equivalent system. They're both very good. Um, and this system is great because it allowed us to not only take the high ULS loads, but it also allowed us to control the stiffness of the walls. Um, and we actually ended up being deflection governed in our bracing wall design. So we were able to just increase the sides of the rods to stiffen up our walls and reduce deflections. Uh, these rod system is also great because they have ratcheting devices at each level. So as the building shrinks, um, which timber will do due to uh, loss of moisture and creep over time, these small uh, ratcheting devices at each level on these rods will just tighten up so that the building, the bracing system maintains its tightness and doesn't need to be hand tightened over the lifetime of the building. Um, as I mentioned, we have PLT floors, um, which came from Woodspan. And these come in panels, I can't remember the exact width, but maybe 900 or one meter wide. Um, and they're just installed um, with the crane. And then we had plywood splices between the panels. And you can also see in this photo, some steel straps that went across the width of the building. And these were to take the diaphragm loads. You can also notice in this photo the steel rods that are sticking up through the floors, and those would be the tension rods um, from the bracing walls of the walls below. So the next walls would get um, lifted in and just drop down on top, and then they'd be able to install the next rods at each level as they go up the building. And then when we get to the top, we have a light steel roof. So we had VHS purlins and a light steel roofing uh, with a warm roof on top and the steel straps for diaphragm action. We also had CLT stairs. So these are the XLM air stair 
Um, I quite like it because it kind of is the only allusion to the timber structure underneath. This is only exposed timber in the building. And these stairs are great because they can also be used during um, construction. So they can just install these stairs right away and they don't have to have separate construction stairs. And then at the end, they can just sand them down and make them look nice and, and ready to go for the final building. We also use some off the shelf rotoblast high um, strength brackets. So we use these at a couple different locations in the structure um, in some of the bracing walls where we had irregularities and had to get the load around windows and openings. Um, and in this photo, we're showing these high strength brackets being used um, at the step in the floors um, at the middle of the building where we had a, uh, the offset floors. We connected these high strength rods from the floor panels into a steel column and then down into the next floor on the other side to transfer the load for the diaphragm through the building. A couple challenges for this um, building. One being coordination. So when we started the design of this project about five years ago, BIM modeling was quite new to us at PTL as well as to the rest of the project team. Um, so it was it took some kind of getting used to from all sides. So you can see on the left is our structural model, um, which we did a full 3D BIM model of, and it modeled all the studs and the beams and columns and everything else required, um, and the architectural model on the right as well as models were done by mechanical services, sprinkler systems. Um, so all the services and architecture and structure could be coordinated during the design phase, which was really great. And we were able to go back and forth and ensure there was no clashes and everything worked really well together. Um, it definitely was quite time consuming. And I think everyone learned a lot about 3D modeling, but it was really good to make sure that we had a structure that worked before any construction was started. These models all got then transferred over to the shop drawing model. Um, and this is Concision's shop drawing model. And this was great because um, as the structural engineer, we could just look through their model and confirm that they had all the correct um, nail spacings and plywood thickness and everything else required for our bracing walls. Um, but it's really important to note that the coordination of the BIM models can't stop at the design phase. It needs to continue on into shop drawings, and that needs to include making sure that somebody has it in their scope to actually coordinate all these shop drawings. So I, I think in this project that wasn't really considered, and Concision ended up doing a lot of coordination, which was great, but I don't think it was in their original scope. Um, and then the other thing is to make sure that the contractor actually is able to and willing to use the 3D models um, once they get into construction as well. Uh, and in this project, McKee Fell, who is the main contractor, did use the models and I think they found them quite helpful. But we have had other experiences with other projects where all this work is done at the front to make sure that all these models are done and all this clash detection is done. And then the contractor is not willing or not able to actually use these models. So it's just important to make sure that that's considered throughout the whole process of the, of the design and construction. Another kind of interesting thing about this project is that as we were designing it, um, we were also co-authoring the brand's light timber frame building design guide. Um, so that was great because we were able to use kind of this guide for our design. And it was also a bit iterative as we discovered new things that needed to be considered in our design, we could also include them back into the guideline. Moisture is also a really important topic to consider for timber structures. So this is a photo that we took on one of our site visits after it had been raining and you can see the water really ponding on the floor of one of the apartment units and you can see the water seeping up the plywood walls and up the concrete and into the bottom plates um, and timber and water don't really mix too well. The timber is going to swell and you can have some issues. Um, with with moisture in timber for sure. So it's really important to make sure that this moisture is well managed on site. And McKee Fell again did a great job of this as we were walking away from this unit, there was already somebody coming by to sweep out all the water. Um, but things that need to be considered on site is making sure that any water that gets in the structure is swept away or vacuumed away um, as soon as possible so that you don't have ponding water seeping into your timber. Uh, any timber elements that need to be stored on site before construction should be properly wrapped and stored off the ground or ideally stored in an indoor environment and then brought to site as they're, as they're needed. As well as making sure that regular um, moisture testing 
occurs by the contractor. So going around with a moisture meter and testing your walls and your floors and your studs and making sure that if there is any water that gets in, because there will be, there, it will rain during construction, um, that is allowed to properly dry out before any linings are installed or any um, some of your final fastening is done. And it's important to consider this kind of moisture management um, as the designer in your specifications and make sure that it's really well communicated the importance of this with the contractor. But it's not just on site management um, for moisture. Moisture can also be dealt with in the design as the engineer. So one example of this is for our glue lamp floor panels. So as these panels get wet, they will expand. So it's important to design things like this with expansion gaps. So just leaving enough space between your panels to ensure that they actually are able to expand as much as they will. And then once they dry out, they can shrink back again, um, as well as having temporary fixing. So between our glue lamp panels, we had these plywood spines. And um, when they were initially installed, they were just installed with some nominal nailing to ensure that they were all held down, but then the final nailing wasn't done until these um, panels meet their equilibrium moisture, um, their in-service moisture, and then the rest of the fixings can be done. So we're not gonna have problems with cracking or um, things like that. Acoustic design is another important factor for timber buildings. And this was coordinated between us and the architects and the acoustic engineers. Um, but in this project, we had double walls for all our intertenancy walls. And that includes double top plates, double bottom plates, and any beams that were across the top of the walls in some locations were also double beams so that we maintained that gap um, for acoustics in between. And then there was insulation in these walls as well. We also had a batten and cradle floating floor system. So the cradles are the little black pieces that you can see in this photo, and those are made of recycled um, rubber tires. And then the battens are placed on top of those and the flooring is um, connected on top of that. And that all sits on top of our glue lamp floor panels. Um, and this just prevents noise from transferring as much between the levels. Fire design is another really important aspect to consider for timber design. So in this project, we had our walls were fully encapsulated with jib um, and we were using a one-way system. And this ensured that the steel rods in our bracing walls didn't get too hot and were able to handle their full required loads during a fire loading situation. And it also meant that our studs were protected um, from charring in the wall. For separation between levels, we had the glue lamp floors were acting, actually acting as the fire separation themselves. So they were designed um, to char and um, act as the fire separation. Um, one problem that we did end up having, which was more during construction, was that the fire engineers decided that all penetrations in the glue lamp floor had to be tested for fire. Um, but luckily, uh, Woodspan was just finishing up their fire testing at that time. So we were able to use the results from that. Um, and it went ahead smoothly. Um, fire design is a really important thing to consider early on in the design and make sure that it's well coordinated between all the um, engineer and the fire engineers and the architects and everyone else involved, because this is getting more and more um, kind of noticed by councils um, going forward. So um, FENS, Fire Engineering New Zealand, is becoming much more stringent, stringent with timber structures and fire, and they're requiring that more and more of the timber be encapsulated. And fire engineers are starting to require that any exposed timber is actually added to your fire fuel load. So just to say that fire is definitely something that needs to be considered um, from the get-go of a project, not kind of as a last minute thought. Being a prefabricated structure, there was many benefits that we saw in this building. So the first one being less noise on site. And this was one of the client's original requirements and it was realized. Um, having all of our wall panels and floor panels coming in as large elements meant that there's a lot less fastening and fixing that actually needs to be done on site. Also with timber construction in general, you just have a lot of a quieter type of construction than with concrete or steel. You're not trying to drill holes through concrete or anything like that. And this is good for the client and the hospice, but also the people that were actually working on site. Um, precision is also a big benefit to prefabrication. So all of these elements were constructed in the 
um, all the wall elements were constructed in the planting concision and they have a lot of automated equipment. So you're really looking at kind of a one or two millimeter tolerance for most of our timber elements. So that means that once these pieces come to site, you're dealing with a lot less um, pulling out the chainsaw and kind of fixing things up that aren't in the right spot on site. Um, the biggest problem we had for this project was actually the interface between the construct uh, the concrete levels and the timber levels. So um, concrete obviously has a lot of larger tolerances than than prefabricated timber. So we did have some areas where um, maybe the precast rods weren't coming out in the exact location in the timber walls that they should have been. So there was a bit of um, working once we got on site to fix some of those issues. But once we got up into the timber, things were very accurate and precise. Another big benefit of prefabrication is less waste. So as I mentioned, there wasn't a lot of room on site. So having less offcuts and things like that to deal with is a big benefit, but also just in terms of cost and sustainability of the project in general, um, having all the walls prefabricated at concision meant that they're able to optimize their design to actually use any offcuts that they might have um, in smaller walls or other um, elements of the structure. Um, so it just saves a lot of small pieces that would typically just be cut and thrown out on construction sites. And this also leads to a much more organized construction site. And again, uh, definitely kudos goes to McKee Fell here. They really ran a, a really um, organized construction site. It was always a pleasure to walk around. And we often found that it was actually a lot neater and tidier than some of the small residential projects that we go to inspect. So that was great. And this just leads to you know, a safer site and more, more pleasant to be around for sure. Prefabrication also means fewer lifting operations and less time with the crane is, is cheaper, it's safer, it's less disruptive to the neighbors and everyone else. Um, you also might be thinking that, well, with these larger elements prefabricated, are they not going to be heavier? But being light timber framing, it's still quite a bit lighter of a construction type than with steel or concrete. So they're able to do the whole structure with this relatively small fixed crane. Easy fastening on site is also a benefit to this type of timber construction. So again, a lot of the fastening had been done before it came to site um, and was automated. But then even once it's on site, timber really is mostly just uh, drilling and screwing and hammering and nailing. And you're not dealing with a lot of large specialized equipment that you would need for concrete or steel. You're not trying to drill through concrete with diamond cord drilling tips or anything like that. So it's, it's quieter and it's easier for the contractors. And another big benefit uh, following on from that is happier subcontractors. So it's a lot easier for them to be able to install their services in this type of timber construction. Um, again, like I mentioned for the fire design, our glue lamp floor actually acted as our fire separation between levels, which meant that we didn't need to have a fire rated ceiling. So that made it easier for the subcontractors installing services in the ceiling. Um, and just in general, yeah, less subcontractors on site at the same time with so many elements being prefabricated as well. We also had separation of trades, which is a really big positive for timber construction. Um, as I mentioned, timber and water don't mix very well. So having concrete being a wet trade um, fully completed by this time we started the timber construction meant that we really didn't have those mixings and we had less sub subcontractors on site so they could finish up all the concrete work. And then once that was done, move on to the timber. There was also reduced propping in this project. So because the walls came in large pieces, they didn't need as much propping and the floors came on relatively quickly. So it was only about two weeks after installing the walls that the floors would actually get installed on top. So they didn't really require propping for very long at all. Um, and also because we used the steel rod system for the bracing walls, um, those rods are able to act as temporary bracing during construction. So they didn't require any other temporary bracing for any wind or seismic loads that might occur during the construction period. Weather tightness is also a benefit to this um, construction. So these walls came from concision, pre-lined, um, pre-wrapped with building wrap and um, with windows already installed. And then by the time the floors got put on top, you were close to having a weather tight structure already um, as each floor got installed. So obviously some water can seep through the glue lamp floors uh, down into the levels below, but not very much and it's, um, 
it's pretty easy to dry that out. Um, and really, the faster you can have a weather tight timber structure, the better off you're going to be and the less issues you're going to encounter. Um, we had another project in Auckland that during one of the COVID lockdowns ended up just being left open for a couple months. And um, there was quite a few issues following on from that with so much water in the structure. So it really, that kind of highlighted to us the importance of having a weather tight timber structure as soon as possible during construction. So a lot of the big um, benefits of, of prefabrication of course is time. Um, and this information came from a key fell, so I don't have a whole lot more information. If you have any specific questions about timing of the project, um, you'd have to refer back to them, but it took about 12 months to actually get out of the ground for the concrete podium to be installed. But once we were above the concrete level, it only took about four months to install the rest of the timber superstructure. And that's a savings of about four months um, compared to traditional timber construction. So it took about, uh, I think two weeks for the walls to be installed and one week for the floors to be installed per level. Um, so really moving quite quickly. And there's obviously a lot of benefits that come along with a faster construction time, um, less scaffolding time, less time required with the crane, um, less time for contractors to be on site. Um, and of course, then the faster that the project is built, the faster that the client is able to actually have renters in these uh, units and able to start making some profit for um, the hospice. Cost is obviously another big question about prefabrication. And for this project, there was not a full cost analysis done. Um, I know there's been some other timber projects recently that have had more complete cost analysis to see what would have been the difference versus concrete or timber or prefabrication or not. But in this case, this is just um, from what we've heard from the contractors, which was that the cost ended up being comparable to a traditional type of construction. However, this was their first um, timber building like this that they had done and they can already see that there will be savings going forward in the future projects. Um, and this comes from, again, the amount of time and a lot of the things I mentioned about a quicker build, um, but also there's less errors that need to be fixed because a lot of stuff is done using automated equipment and everything is well coordinated um, beforehand. And also the more of these types of projects that are constructed, um, hopefully these costs will continue to come down as construction companies start to really understand the process of what one of these builds takes. And as QSs start to um, really see how much this stuff costs and not have kind of markups for uncertainty around timber construction. Carbon emissions is another um, benefit to timber projects. And this is something that is being talked about more and more. Um, now, bear in mind, this is a very simplistic approach. And this information, again, came from McKee Fell. Um, so for any assumptions on, on this modeling, you'd have to refer to them. And this is only looking at the embodied carbon in the actual um, building materials of this project. So it's not looking at transportation of these materials or um, the energy to maintain or repair or um, the energy to actually run the units. Um, but it just gives you a good indication of comparing kind of a timber construction to another type of construction. So if we look at this project, uh, we had about 100 kg CO2 equivalent per meter squared. And if we compared that to a similar commercial building in steel or concrete, you'd be more looking at 250 kgs of CO2 equivalent per meter squared. So it is quite a big savings to have so much timber in the structure. And if you look at the graph on the right, um, the different colors are showing the different construction materials and how much um, CO2 they contribute to the project. And uh, if you consider that half of the green section, half of the concrete is actually coming from the driveway and the parking lot, um, you can see that the timber in the project actually does come quite close, it makes a huge dent in the overall um, CO2 of the structure. So and this kind of just goes to show that using timber in your structure is definitely a good way to reduce the amount of carbon in the structure. Um, even if you're looking at a, an even more hybrid type system with only timber glue lamp floors, for example, and steel and concrete everywhere else, it definitely is a good benefit. But again, this is a very simplistic approach and definitely something that I think a lot of us need to everyone's gonna be considering more in the future. So a couple of the main lessons learned from this project. 
Um, the first one is that early interaction with the prefabricator is um, really important. So in this project, concision wasn't actually brought on board until the tendering process. So the design was fully complete. And it would have been really great if we had been able to actually interact with them during the design because um, in a large project, project like this, some small design decisions can have a huge impact on efficiency of construction. So one example in this project is that for our bracing walls, um, where the plywood panels intersected, we just had one single 45 wide stud. And then we had our nails at an angle to make sure that we had the required edge distances, um, which structurally is a fine detail. But once Concision actually started looking at the design, they realized that this is not something that they could um, do with their equipment. So they actually ended up having to build a jig and then have someone on each wall panel jump up on the wall and hand nail off. Um, all of the plywood spines. So that's an example of something that we would have changed the detail during design if we'd been able to talk to them and kind of see what works best for their specific equipment because all different prefabricators might have different machinery as well with different capabilities. So earlier you can have interaction with the people that are actually building your structure, the more efficient it will be. Uh, the next one comes from feedback from McKee Fell from the contractor, which was keep it simple. So this photo is showing all the elements required for the bracing wall tension rod systems. Um, and we had already pared down our design from the original design to have only maybe six different sizes of rods in the structure. And that means six different sizes of all the other components that go along with it. And obviously, the more efficient you can be in terms of using the smallest rods or the smallest screws or brackets you can everywhere in the building is cheaper in terms of material costs. But our feedback from McKee Fell was that it ended up being more of a pain and more cost for them to spend all the time to try to sort out and organize and make sure that they have the right components going in the right place. Um, and if there were any errors to kind of spend time rectifying that. So for them, they would have preferred and they would prefer on future projects to have only maximum maybe two different rod sizes and the same goes for yeah screws and brackets and all other different components. Another big one I know I talked about coordination before but services coordination is really important so I mentioned that we had kind of a fully coordinated design during the design process but then once the contractors actually get on site they might not actually agree with those services um, designs and they just kind of might drill holes wherever they see fit. So this was a couple of photos that we took from site inspections. Um, the photo on the left is showing the diaphragm straps on the glue lamp floors and we just came to find holes drilled all over the place. Um, so this had to be remediated by adding some additional straps. And in the photo on the right, you can see this is the um, stairwell landing and the core bowls supporting those landings um, had holes drilled under three of the four fixing locations. So these were all items that could be rectified and there are always going to be small things, but just, I, I'm not sure what the answer is to this problem, but just to say that it's really important to kind of coordinate your services as much as possible. And this might be done during design, but then ensuring that that information is passed on to the contractors that are actually doing it and that they're on board with um, the design that has been done. So just a summary of our lessons learned, um, earlier involvement of the prefabricator and any contractors really as early as possible to get their take on the design is, is really key. Use BIM to the full potential. So during design, during shop drawings, and also during construction and making sure that your contractor is willing and able to use those BIM models. Um, moisture management is really important for timber construction, both uh, during the actual construction, but also during the design as an engineer. Simplify your design wherever you can, um, not necessarily making it the most efficient in terms of using the smallest member sizes, but just making it the simplest and kind of avoiding mistakes on site and coordinating your services as best as possible. So I think overall, um, this project was definitely a success. The client was very happy. Um, the contractor uh, was very happy. They're already moving on to their next couple projects like this. I think they're definitely have become large, big advocates for um, light timber frame buildings for in New Zealand. 
and um, maybe the sky's not the limit because you can't go super high with this stuff in the seismic zone, but probably five or six stories. And we're seeing a lot more of these types of buildings being designed and constructed since this one happened. So it's very exciting. So I'm just going to, hopefully this video works. I'm gonna quickly pay, play you this video from my tech. Um, and this is kind of talking about the rod system and also gives you some good time-lapse videos of, of the construction. The structure has five stories in light human framing, where the framing walls are doing both the gravity and the lateral load. So, although we're used to build in light human framing in New Zealand, quite seldom we go to five stories, which also means we have some quite high seismic forces and also high deflections. Uh, timber is a very great construction material. Um, I'm a timber specialist, so I love working with timber. And one of the challenges we definitely had to face is what does the timber do over the lifetime, the 50 years, what does it do in terms of compression for the grain? And that's where the MITEX Z4 system comes into play because it allows for this vertical shrinkage. One of the benefits of using the Z4 continuous rod system is that there are cinch nuts at each level and what those do is basically they're ratcheting devices so as the building is shrinking the cinch nuts allow for that movement so that the bearing plate is in continuous contact with the bottom plate. So over time as the building shrinks um, the rod system will shrink with the building and kind of keep everything tight. Another benefit of using the Z4 system is that um, as you build the building, uh, it provides temporary bracing. So it, as each level is installed um, and the cinch nuts are installed and the bearing plate plates are installed, there's already temporary bracing at each level, uh, which just makes construction easier as you go. Original sort of thinking, you know, traditional steel and concrete structure decided it was going to be, be too noisy for that sort of environment. So then with the design team, it's a process of really breaking down, thinking is there another way to do it? And the subcontractors and the designers to get everything sort of shop drawn and ready to go um, meant that the timber package has been the, the right solution to put a structure up very quickly. My tech was really helpful when we were going through the design process because um, we were able to ask them a lot of questions and they gave us a lot of good technical answers whenever we needed. Uh, we worked with the MyTech engineering team and they just gave us a lot of support uh, during the design. We had some good meetings, some good workshops with the MyTech team that really helped us to kind of hammer out any issues that we were having. It was a very collaborative approach and that was great to ensure that we were on the right path and that all our questions were answered to ensure that we were confident with the final design. Another really helpful aspect was that MyTech provided us with shop drawings of all the rod systems for each wall individually so that um, we were able to check and make sure that all components were there and on site they were then able to cross-reference between the shop drawings and it was very clear for everyone involved so that was quite helpful. This design here required a model analysis or so something a bit more complex compared to normal design but once you get a head around uh, it is very straightforward and there's no big difference compared to a traditional steel or concrete structure. Obviously you deal with a different construction material but um, there's nothing which is uh, completely new to the system. It's just the extension of what we do in normal residential design. And I encourage all engineers who are willing to try this. It is not rocket science. It just needs a bit of reading and then applying the design. Although it's a five-story building, it came together very well. And uh, the construction phase where was very smooth.
So thank you to MyTech for allowing us to show that video. Um, and thank you everyone for listening and also a big thanks to all the project partners, um, all the design team and all the suppliers and manufacturers. It was definitely a, a big team effort. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions now. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, that was really very interesting and thorough. Um, uh, an immense uh, effort uh, by the PTL uh, team to design this uh, uh, to design this uh, multi-story uh, building, and uh, yeah, uh, we've got uh, many questions. Uh, the first one coming from James, saying, "What is Tiara uh, Opuanga?" Um, luckily, I looked this up right before the presentation in case this was a question. Um, it's the rising of Huanga, which is the star that precedes Matariki. And um, I think that the client, the uh, Mary Potter Hospice, they have kind of a star as the kind of a theme of their whole thing. So it, it fit in well with that. Very good. Alistair Waller asking uh, for your ply shear wall design did you have to account for the over strength of the screw fixings uh, to the jib linings over the ply into uh, the timber frame in addition uh, to the over uh, strength of your ply nails um that's a good question i personally didn't do anything about that on the project. I think they ended up having to go, I think they potentially ended up using staples for some of um, for some of these different linings uh, in the project at Concision um, because we didn't use uh, any of the jib for any bracing or anything that, that was non-structural. And I know that there was quite a bit of back and forth about that uh, question, but I, I'm not sure what the exact solution was. But no, we didn't. We didn't consider that. Okay. Now, uh, Michael Ho uh, asking the building seems to be irregular. Uh, did you uh, use the model response spectrum method on uh, so, uh, on seismic design? If so, what is the com computer analysis used and also how do you estimate the stiffness of the timber bracing walls? Um, yep, good question. So we did end up using a modal spectrum analysis um, and we used RFM software to do that. Um, and for the uh, estimate of the stiffness, so we did design this using a modal um, uh, sorry, modal response spectrum analysis. And then we also developed um, a spreadsheet that kind of we used to design all the components for our bracing walls. So being the plywood thickness, the nail spacing required, the number of cords, the hold down rod size, all that type of things. Um, and then in designing that spreadsheet, we were able to actually calculate the stiffness of all these different elements to, to get an estimate of the stiffness of our bracing walls, which we then fed back into our modal response spectrum model and it was quite an iterative process um, of course as these things are but yeah and and that procedure is talked about in the brand's guideline as well so you can kind of read through and kind of see how that how that all works yeah now uh toby uh cherry asked how did you resolve the bracing on the building elevation with the uh, large balcony doors also, uh, there are very few walls here to use for bracing. Um, yeah, so we actually didn't have any or many bracing walls, at least on the external, on that external line. Um, we had a lot of internal bracing walls um, at the hallway. And then there were some small, very narrow bracing walls between doors. But yeah, they were quite wide opening. So we didn't have any portal frames or anything along those lines. We just had some quite narrow walls along that line. And, and most of that load was being taken by the internal walls. Okay, now uh, Bhargav uh, Patel asking, can you uh, give some examples of the new things you uh, mentioned that uh, you discovered during your project? 
that you included in the brands timber guide, design guide? Uh, good question. Again, I don't personally really have any examples of this. I was just starting at the time um, as this design guide was being written. Uh, that's just feedback that I got from the guys in the office that there was definitely some kind of iterations, but I don't have any specific examples for you, unfortunately. Okay, thank you. Uh, Tim Swaga asking, was the plywood still okay to use after getting wet? Was there any delamination, any plywood requiring replacement uh, to uh, uh, on-site uh, moisture? Um, no, the plywood was still okay to use after getting wet. Um, as I mentioned, it's important to make sure that you're having um, moisture measurements being taken throughout construction. So uh, I don't remember what the actual schedule was for this, but I know that the um, McKee Fell guys were going around and taking regular moisture meters. And again, you could see in that photo that there was some water seeping up into the plywood panel, but again, they swept out that water right away and it was allowed to dry out. And the important thing is to make sure that before um, any other linings are put on top that it's allowed to dry out. And in this case, we didn't have any major issues with water and the plywood, the plywood was all fine. Thank you. Uh, Michael also asking, uh, are the lift shafts concrete on all levels? If so, how do you deal with the uh, difference in uh, stiffness between the timber bracing walls and lift shafts? Um, nope, in this case, the lift shafts were concrete only on um, in the podium level. And then above that, they became light timber frame walls. So they had the same um, stiffness as the rest of the light timber frame walls and they were tied in in that way. So we didn't have that problem in this, in this project. The continuation of the question saying, does it have uh, a, a high shear demand on the diaphragm uh, connections to the lift shaft if they are concrete? Um, yeah, in this project, they, they were light timber frame walls as well. So we didn't have that problem with an, a high shear demand on the diaphragm um, because they, they ended up having the same kind of stiffness. So it didn't really affect the diaphragm too much in that, in that way. Okay, Richard asking, what was the total floor depth, including ceiling and uh, floating floor? Um, I'm not sure what the total architectural depth would have been. Uh, we had 120 millimeter thick glue lamb floors, but I, I don't know off the top of my head what, what the rest of the buildup was, sorry. Okay, Barry Smith asking, how did you deal with galvanized roof members sitting on uh, treated timber? That's very interesting. Hmm, yeah, that is a good question. I'm, I'm not sure what the detail was for this specifically. Um, I would imagine that it was probably just specified a DPM um, layer sitting between those two things so that we didn't have any contact specifically between the two. But I'm actually not sure if the roof members were galvanized because they were internal in a and there was a warm roof on top but I, I don't I don't have that I don't have a specific answer for that one for you unfortunately sorry Barry okay uh, Karen asking also another interesting question how did you justify the split level floors without a seismic gap mm, yeah good question so um, as you saw in the plans, there was a split level kind of at the middle of the building. And what we ended up doing um, for this was that we had two large steel columns, uh, large UC sections that kind of went up right in the middle of the building. And then we used those large um, rotoblast brackets that I showed, and they just connected to the floor level on one side and then into the column. And then that was also connected on the other side. So we had these kind of brackets connecting the diaphragms all the way up. So we were making sure that the, the diaphragms were actually working together through the use of these large steel columns in the middle of the building. Okay, now this is a long question and I'm going only to read the first uh, line. Yep. Domenico, uh, what testing has been done on the ratcheting, ratcheting system uh, for the bracing uh, rods? 
Sorry, I'm just reading the rest of the question quickly. <laughs> it's a long one. I don't want to read. Oh, maybe you can read it. Um, short answer is uh, this is something that you'd probably have to take up with MyTech or Simpson Strong Tie. I know that they have done a lot of testing. Um, these systems, although being fairly new to New Zealand, are uh, used very, very commonly in North America. Um, and I know that there's been a lot of testing done on this, but I don't know specifically about extra um, extra loads under cyclic loading. Sorry, I'm not sure about that one. Yeah, that split level had raised a few questions today. Uh, another question saying with the split levels, what diaphragm force did you consider for the design of the steel columns connecting the split levels? I think I'm gonna to have to pass on that one. This was Daniel from our team that really took the lead on that section of the design and I'm not exactly sure, sorry about that. Daniel is on leave. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, another question from uh, Bram, uh, was this project a design and built or just a traditional one? No, this was just traditional. So all the design happened and then the contractor was brought on board after the fact. Okay. I believe. Jean I believe. <laughs> Okay, Jean asking, how long did the structural design take? Mm. <laughs> Good question. Um, when I came to PTL, I think I worked on it for about a year before we were finished, but I know that the design had been uh, ongoing for quite a while before I got there. So I'm not actually for sure from the initial preliminary design, like I mentioned, uh, maybe I didn't mention it, but originally they were thinking of doing it in CLT. So I think there was some concept design stuff around that. So I'm not exactly sure what, when the project actually started, but yes, it was, it wasn't quick. <laughs> there might be a couple more questions that we might pass on to you for answering because yep. like now on time uh, to, uh, go back to work. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Emma, yeah. once again for your uh, thorough and uh, really very interesting uh, talk of uh, today. Um, we, 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 we wish like uh, uh, to see you once again in future. And uh, guys, we look forward to see you on the 23rd of June for the next uh, TDS uh, webinar. Thank you very much. Have a lovely and great day. Bye-bye. Thanks very much.